Tonight you'll meet the guy who's behind some pretty popular polling numbers. Welcome into my state of mind. I am Dan York. You'll meet Jim Marone. He's the director of the Taubman Institute at Brown University. He's the guy who has made a lot of splash with the polling numbers that have come out of that fine institution. We have a lengthy conversation with Jim about uh, the mayor's race in Providence, the governor's race, and beyond. So let's get to it because we're a little bit of a rush tonight because we've got uh, a lot that we want to bring you. The truth is, we've already pre-taped the conversation with the professor, so I know how long it ran, so I know how little time I have right now. So I've got a math number in time spent on this broadcast to hit, and I'm wasting time as we speak. Hurry up! Hurry up! Says Jess. Uh, heavy hearts, no doubt. The news out of Boston was hard for a lot of people today. Uh, Michelle is in town. That would be the first lady to you. This is a weird, weird story. Some really bad journalism causing a candidate to have to respond, I think, unnecessarily. What else do I have for you real quick? It is every one-on-one. -on -one. It was a historic night last night, and I'll sneak in your state of mind if I can hustle through this and get it done on time. So just wanted to make mention. I mean, everybody is, is talking about and feeling awful down and sad about the idea that Tom Menino is gone. At 71 years of age, the uh, so popular mayor in the city of Boston, um, has lost his battle. I'll tell you, I, I met Tom Menino a couple of times, interviewed him a couple of times, and he was, uh, he was a unique individual. I can't offer a lot of insight, didn't know him, uh, to be able to you know, reflect on him as a person, only kind of as a spectator in his mayoralty, but there's no doubt that like Ed Koch was a signature on the city of New York, Tom Menino was a signature on the city of Boston, and I'm sure there are a lot of heavy hearts in Boston and Massachusetts throughout New England and the country today. And our condolences go out to, to all. Uh, next item here. Michelle is in town. She's staying. Did we find out where she's staying, by the way? We don't know. We don't know where she and the president are staying. He's coming in on Air Force One, which I didn't think could land at our own airport, but I, I guess it can. I guess the runway is long enough, or it has like super brakes on it. Anyway, uh, Michelle Obama in town. There's the headline, uh, I didn't know that we were rebuilding the middle class. Well, it's a new, at least it's a different way to say jobs, 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 jobs. She was at the Juanita Sanchez School, and hey, there's her old friend Gina Raimondo, who she just met for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how the endorsement business goes. And the president will be in tomorrow, and he'll meet Gina probably for the first time. He'll also meet uh, Jorge Lorza who he endorsed for mayor, who he's never met. Authentic? You'll have to figure it out. By the way, do you see all the phones? That you know, used to be a day when you couldn't do any photography. Now you've got thousands of people who are their own photojournalists. What else do we have here today? Yeah, this is kind of strange. 38 Insider. So long story made short, because I only have a little bit of time here, here's the headline that, uh, well, this is, you know, this, they're always going back and forth and charging each other with robbing banks, that kind of thing, right? But right now, you've got the, uh, so, so Channel 10 does this story on Alan Fung having been inside on the 38 Studios recruiting, like he was trying to get Kurt Schilling's 38 Studios company into Cranston back in 2010 before he landed in the city of Providence. So they get some source to give them a memo from one person within 38 Studios community to another person within 38 Studios community <laughs> that, you know, Alan Fung is interested. What source? And by the way, does that mean that Alan Fung actually, well, here's what Fung said about it. Never met with Kurt Schilling, never met with anyone from 38 Studios to talk about moving to Cranston. We all know they never looked at Cranston. So I'm not sure where that's even coming from. Like I said, I don't know who this latent communications person is. This, um, I don't even know what her first name is. This uh, individual who's from out of state, from what I understand. I don't know this Zaccanino individual, and I don't know any of the players involved. Yeah, I, I feel badly for Alan Fung on this one. To have to answer to this, it's a ridiculous piece of journalism, seems to me. And the Raimondo camp's making a big deal about it. Gee, you think maybe they could be a source? It's just dumb, dumb, dumb. Next item. Everyone on one. This is all I got to say about that. Channel 10's debate last night convinced me of one thing, that everybody is ganging up on Buddy. Now, you may not cry a river for that. You may actually applaud it. 
But this guy knew what he was getting into at the beginning. There's no doubt that media moderators for broadcast and community events, debates, that kind of thing, and the candidates that are running against him are all on him. It was a mauling last night that they attempted, but, you know, the old guy's still fighting. By the way, he's coming here tomorrow night for one more visit. All right, what else do I have for you real quick? Uh, it was a historic night. This guy, Baumgarten, he is unbelievable. I'll have more to say about that, as so many others will, who are baseball fans, when we have time. But I have to pause. We shall come back, and you will meet Jim Marone, the professor at Taubman, about polls, polls, polls. Well, there's no doubt that my guest has energized the political conversation here in the last couple of weeks. And I first saw him when I was in attendance at the debate for the mayoral candidates on the campus at Brown University. The Taubman Center and some other entity sponsored the, the Brown mayoral debate. And uh, a little heat in the kitchen over that debate. But uh, Professor Jim Arone is here. You run the Taubman Center, which I is a new gig for you. New gig for me, and it's a lot of fun. Welcome. Gets me on shows like this. It's nice to have you. It's great to be here. Well, we've had a long relationship with the Taubman Center um, because, the truth be told, media and budget cuts and the way that's been going in general, we are starved for polling data. Channel 12, my employer here, uh, and the Providence Journal, combine the resources to pay for Jim Fleming's polling. But other than that, what used to be every media outlet was competing with polling in the day, they don't do it anymore. And polling has become such a dark art. I mean, it is complicated. Getting getting the um, likely voters, nailing them down, it's Hard. gotten a lot more complicated. People don't want to tell pollsters the truth. They've got cell phones. They hide from you. It used to be you'd get 60% response rate. Now you're lucky if you get 20%. People are sick of politics and they're sick of polls. So it's become a very intense kind of business. Well, that's interesting. So why do you do it? Because we love it. You know, it's so interesting. You go out there, there's not much data. You learn a lot about Rhode Island, about what's on people's minds. You really get a texture for the political races as you go along. So. This is new to me. I have to educate myself on the whole art of polling. You've been at Brown for a while. I've been at Brown a long time. I'm new to public policy. Okay. So what kind of re-up training did you have to do to uh, engage the Taubman Center, which is really a, uh, a staple of Brown services yes. to the public and, and, and beyond? And the person who used to do the polls retired. Marion Orr. Mary, uh, Marion Orr and right. Jack Coombs. I went right back to Darrell West, the man who really started polling right. at the Taubman Center, now at Brookings. We had lunch, and he said, better you than me. Get, getting into the polling business every time you come out yeah, results with people Darryl don't like. loved it. He, he loved, loved it, it, and loved so do it. I. Yeah. You, you just get the, the feel, the texture, the, the pace of the whole political but you world. But are, you are um, an influencer by the very idea that you offer these polls. Uh, guys like me and people like me in the media gravitate to them, chew them up. Uh, oh my gosh, or I knew it, come right. out our mouths. And the voters then are engaged with this, and I'm not quite sure how a poll moves a voter's behavior, but I'm certain that it does. So you have a responsibility that's very, very high here. Yes, it is true. And every time a poll comes out, we scrutinize the numbers and we think, what are the consequences of this poll? Great example, the first Buddy Cianci poll we did. We were neutral, we got the poll, and there's Cianci behind by 10 points. Mm. It's the first poll that shows that. Mm. I sit down Let's with put my that poll up, people. Jess, if we can put that one up, just, just since you, you brought it up, this is the poll. Now remember, the WBRI Projo poll a month earlier had Cianci up six, and six. when this came out, this was like the, shock, the shot heard round the Providence world and yes. really rattled a lot of cages. Rattled a lot of cages. And I said, we're going to sit on this poll. We're going to go out and pay for another poll. And I want the gold standard for likely voters on that second poll. I, I don't want to release those numbers unless we're absolutely sure. We went, we hired this firm from California that did a lot of Obama's uh, fancy stuff. And we did what they call a three-screen likely voter. Did they vote in the 2012 2014 primary, 2012 general election, then do they say they're likely voters. So these are people who voted twice. The numbers came back exactly the same. 
So then we released all the numbers, and we thought, okay, we're pretty sure. Two polls, two methodologies came out the same way. Well, since we rolled in the Mary's race, let's jump in, jump into it. Here's what here's what the Go Local Prov uh, threw out. They they were able to obtain, I say in quotes, the uh, the the daily polling, the tracking poll numbers. This was the last day of three days that were released. Uh, undecided at 34 percent gives you an indication that the data is too raw and too uh, and too flimsy to really count on. But these are the daily trackings that Ciancy obviously wanted to. Uh, have someone investigate. Clearly, he just gave it to the local people and said, by the way, we got to change the conversation. I know, though, that their internals on both a rolling and on a substantial uh, uh, larger pool basis have had him up by high single digits the entire way. So they're having a hard time believing that your stuff is real. How do you reconcile that? You know, and uh, Joey Palino showed me the numbers the day our poll came out. I, he's a friend of Brown's. I told him just a little ahead of time, these polls, you're not going to like these numbers, but check them twice. And he told me, you know, we think we're breaking 50%. Anybody who thinks polls is an ac exact, absolute science, you know, is just deluding themselves. It's conceivable their polls are better than ours. All I know is we really went with the gold standard on that second poll triple screen that's very hard to you do. You offered something on the radio the other day that I thought was fascinating. You talked about the Bradley effect um, and uh, that of course comes from Mayor Bradley in Los Angeles way back when when voters didn't want to admit that they'd vote for an African American right, right. but did and he won even though he was way down in the polls. Do you think there might be a science effect I here? I would not be at all surprised. Some pollster calls up, says he's calling from Brown University. I like CNC, but I don't want to admit it to some stranger. But when I get into that voting booth, I'm going to pull the button for CNC. You know, when I walk around downtown, when I talk to people downtown, particularly when they know I released the poll, they give me an earful. There's a lot of strong sentiment for CNC. I think we, there's a chance we may have to rename the Bradley effect the CNC effect. And I, you know, I wouldn't, I would not be shocked if that were the case. You know, some would say, those who are pessimistic would say, Boy, this brown guy is really sharp. He's already built in his excuse if he blew the poll. If we blew all our polls, I'm going to have egg on my face. <laughs> right. If Cianci comes after we've done really good polling, showing him 10 down with a normal poll, we just ask people if they're going to vote, and they say yes, you take their word for it, then the gold standard, did you vote in 2012, did you vote in 2010, are you going to vote today? And, and so we're going off of actual voter rolls. If Cianci comes back from those two polls, something different is going on. I'm saying it's something special. Right. And the Bradley effect, out it goes. It's the Cianci effect. And I'm going to go downtown with egg on my face, down to City Hall, and I Cianci's going to make me eat every word of those polls. I know that. Right, but well, it'll be fun. When we come back, though, the governor's race, amazing shift in just a couple of weeks. Stay with us. Professor Jim Marone from the Taubman Center, public policy guys at Brown, they're very important to the public conversation. And I think the Taubman Center does a nice job integrating Brown University with the public. Sometimes, though, on talk radio, as we're kind of roll around what you're producing, it causes either uh, people want to hug you or slay you. you know? Yes, so, I've, I've heard those, but, too. But, you know, Brown's got that kind of reputation in town anyway. We love Brown, and then something wacky happens on campus, and we all go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that school is here. You know, So that's kind of the way it goes anyway, right, with Brown? We're looking for more of those hugs and less of the slaying, but, sure. hey. And then there's all the, the reason to actually have more hugs, no doubt. Now, so the Taubman Center comes out with, uh, with uh, the original, this is two, three weeks ago, data only released uh, less than two weeks ago. This is the governor's race originally. And this was like, oh, poor Alan Fung. And you know, that Robert Healy, if he wasn't in the race, he's taken all that stuff from, uh, from Alan Fung. And that was the narrative with 18% undecided, especially on the talk radio lines. Right. Then you threw another poll out there and blew everybody's mind with a, with a dead heat and Healy grabbing another three points. So let me ask you this. You didn't pull the AG's race in the original thing, right. and you were very candid about saying, you know what, we made a mistake there. Did you go back for the AG's race and say, heck, we might as well do the governor's race too? Or did you just say, i got to pull this governor's race again? Both. But we were going back anyway, so we thought, we're going back for the AG's. And we blew it on that one. We were trying to make the poll shorter. We thought, oh, let's throw that one out. Everybody screamed bloody murder. So, oh, mistake. Yeah. Go back in for the AG's. So two things. One, as long as you're going in for a, a statewide poll, throw in the governor anyway. But we had the sense there was a lot of flux in the governor's race. We're picking up a lot of noise, a lot of anecdotal evidence. And we said, you know, we're just feeling a lot of shifting in this thing. 
So everybody who was talking, now this wasn't systematic evidence, but people were talking, there seemed to be a lot of flux. There's another thing going on. All, all the Republicans, there's a Republican wave that seems to be happening. Scott Brown catching fire in New Hampshire. Uh, the Massachusetts race, same thing. Martha Coakley going to blow it again. Yeah, Charlie Baker's right Charlie there. Charlie Baker looks like he's going to win that race. So there's not just the talk and the chatter in Rhode Island, but there's a kind of wave developing across New England for, uh, on the Republican side. So we had lots of reason to go back in for this poll. But boy, the results surprised us. Mm. I, I don't know if I, you caught last night's show, uh, but I, I said it's really funny because Gina Raimondo had these had this large pile of, of, of chips on the table. So popular at the beginning of this race, all she could do is try to hold on to enough to win. Because it's hard to maintain that kind of equity when you're getting right. when you're in a competitive right. race. Alan Fung, though, in the debate on, on Channel 6 the other night, looked like um, he was wetting his pants over the idea that he might actually be in this race. You know, so, he, so Gina's been way too careful, yeah. ticked off the bishop. Yeah. Even though 70% of uh, Rhode Islanders are pro-choice, they'd like to keep a soft conversation about it. And she goes and digs in, bang, I think your poll reflects a Gina fatigue and then a Gina reaction. I would say, if I'm gonna judge your poll, it makes sense to me. And Fung is as surprised as anybody, I think, if you really I, asked him, yeah. that he's in this thing. Right, to actually have some outsider come in, not right. just his internal polls, and right. say, you are in it big time. Yeah. And there's, you know, the, the headline from this poll is, 52% of Democrats supporting Gina. That is a terrible number. 25% of but Democrats. But predictable in the sense that she took a stand yeah. on pension reform. Labor feels hurt by right. the change in the numbers. He knew that she would have a shaky ground there. It shouldn't be that shaky this late in the election. And if it is, that's the explanation for being in trouble. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's both. I think, I think your data confirms what, what, uh, what I and a lot of others think, and that is she went way left, which is confusing to a lot of people, but that's helping to satisfy the base I get. The manipulation of this race, running through a primary and then having to run a general, is all finesse. And sometimes you're too smart for yourself. And you know, you just made a really good point. This is a conservative campaign. Pull out of, the, uh, pull out of as many debates, run very cautiously, then throw a couple of darts, right. like the, uh, like the pro-choice business. Talk to me about the Healy factor. What, what, what do you think about it? It is so interesting. So we usually, you'd expect a third party candidate to be losing air around now, particularly as the debate, as the election gets closer. Not Healy, he's up to 11.8%. He is, his people are really intense also. After the first poll, we got more phone calls about Healy than either of the other two candidates. The Fung camp let us have it. They blasted us, we're not that far behind. But they, what we were getting on the, on the lines was Healy, Healy, Healy. The big question is who's Healy taking votes from? 10% of Democrats are saying that they're gonna vote for Healy. So that's a lot when you're having a hard time picking up your base. But Healy, particularly after last night, that didn't pick, get picked up in the poll, Healy is getting the under 30s. Mm -hmm. They are attracted to him. Usually Democratic votes under 30. So very interesting in our results. Under 30 this last poll, Fung picking up a lot, Healy picking up a lot. It may be that the under, th under 30, Gina lost them, they went to Fung, now they're going on to Healy. He can't win. He can't win. He can't win, but boy, he is having a good time, isn't he? Mm. He's right there in the middle of the mix, and he could determine the winner. And it's not clear whether he's gonna hurt Fung more or hurt Healy more. And someone suggests that if he really had a principle he wanted to see executed in the next four years, a platform, some policy, that he could barter that, he could barter that number for one of those other candidates to do, uh, you know, a borrow. It doesn't seem like he's inclined to do that. He's going to stay in the entire way. And you know what? It's America, man. He's in there for third party politics. He's in there he's to prove a about third party. He's tossed a couple of suckers on that table, a couple issues that maybe no one would be talking about. We saw him toss one in last night. You think that the GOTV, meaning the get out the vote effort the Democrats bring, shades a point, point and a half for Gina's way, right? I stole that from you. Yeah. Point, point and a half. If you pushed me and said, okay, you've got to decide tomorrow, this race is being decided tomorrow. You know, it's true that every poll, often not within margin of error, but every poll, a little, a lot, has Gina ahead. If you add up all the polls, my best guess, tomorrow, election tomorrow, Gina by two. Throw in your point and a quarter, Gina by three. 
but it's not tomorrow. Right. There's a lot of shifting in this. No doubt. Uh, the AG's race, by the way, post that real quick, Jess. Uh, this was, I think, uh, not surprising to me, but it shows you that when major media pay little attention to such an important race, that democratic behavior kind of rules the day, at least pollable behavior. But you mentioned something about this that I thought was interesting the other day. You don't think that this 50-37 lead is as substantial and concrete as one may think when they look at it for yes, the first time. Yes, I think Hutchinson's running a pretty good campaign. He's doing a good job, He's, but it's been invisible. Democrats staying home, looks like they're not really thinking about it. 71.7% for Kilpatrick. Republicans, of course, but there aren't enough of them, 81% for Hutchinson. But I think if there were a sharp light shed on this race, it might really scramble the results. Yeah. Is there going to be a sharp light? No. Because the governor's race is going to take all the oxygen. Or Hodgson runs an ad that looks you square in the eye and says, listen, if you're a Democrat, think this thing through, yo. I mean, sometimes you got to break through the clutter and just really try to get one-on-one -on -one with that Yes. Voter. But who's who knows? Yes. That's I don't have a, you know, I don't have a sense that these are really firm. These are just, oh, yeah, he's a Democrat. He's an incumbent. I'm well, voting for him. Well, listen, I think you've been a, a spirited contributor to the dialogue. Um, when the election comes, come on back and we'll Great. see how good it was. All right. And we'll All right. I'm going to look for hugs right after the election. There you go. Jim Marone, Professor Todd Mayer Brown. Final word in the weekend. Lots of fun things. You know, the interesting thing about polls is that when we get, this, we get to this time with only days in front of the election, it feels a little bit like no man's land. We don't have very recent data to hold on to. And there's still debates going on and last minute advertising pushes. So. The moral of the story is the only poll that really matters is Tuesday, Election Day. One guy who wants your votes and to take another stab at it is Buddy Cianci. He's back here tomorrow night at 7.30 on My State of Mind. I'll see you on the radio tomorrow at noon on WPRO. Thanks for watching.